I'm Scott Al Miller. This is Sam IT, the juxtaposition of information technology and business. <laughs> Today, I want to explain why ransomware shouldn't be the big fear that it is, and if it is for you, why this should be a concern for you and your environment. So what is ransomware? I think we all know what it is, but just to recap, ransomware works by an infiltrator. This could be someone who's hacking into your environment. This could be someone who just opened an email attachment and it got into your environment or whatever. If this happens to you, if uh, the ransomware is effective, what it does is it goes through your environment and it uses encryption technology to encrypt the data throughout your environment. It may extricate that data data, it may move it to the hacker, it may move it to a third party location as well. It generally leaves the data in place just encrypted so that there is at least the ability to promise a means of recovering that data. That's where the ransom comes in or that they may share that information with the outside world. They've managed to extricate it and then they're going to uh, hold you for blackmail to keep you from uh, selling it to the, ransom, the rest of the, well, the world. So technically ransomware only applies to the the term only applies to the encryption if they were to extricate your data which is a much bigger thing much more difficult uh much easier to detect then that is technically blackmailware not ransomware there is no ransom for that data it is a blackmail for that data uh and that is not very effective because there's no guarantee at all that they won't release it at some later date and so paying for that uh, is something that most companies won't do but ransomware if the ransom portion if your data is encrypted companies will often pay to get that data back and that's where the profit is for the organization that is carrying out this attack that is the uh the, the driving factor for them however the idea that you would pay uh, potentially a very large sum of money to decrypt data that is on your servers uh, makes very little sense because in any proper production environment, any anything that can be called production, anything that can be a, a semblance of having done the most minuscule IT job will have backups. And it is faster under almost all circumstances to restore from backup than it is to restore from ransomware. In order to restore from ransomware through the paid the ransom process, the same long process of encryption that encrypted your environment must be run to decrypt the environment. But that must be done after a ransom is paid and the ransom is paid after a negotiation phase. So there's always a delay. Even if a company wanted to pay the ransom right away, there is still a delay as they figure out how to do so, that's not always clear. They contact them, get the information on how to pay, make the payment, wait for the payment to clear. Uh, often the payment is desired in a means that is not standard, it's not a wire transfer or something like that. Maybe it's an ACH, maybe it's a, a cryptocurrency. Those things, while they may be relatively fast, they're not 30 seconds, they're not five minutes. They're generally going to take a few hours, if not a few days. And uh, in the case of an ACH, it could take quite a bit of time. If a company has never used crypto before, they may have you know, a bit of delay as they figure out how to do the things that are being requested of them. So even if we just assume a few hour delay in making this payment, then we hope, it's only a hope, that you will get the decryption key and be able to start decrypting, which could take a very long time, depending on the size of your environment, the power of your computers, and so forth. This makes paying a ransom relatively ineffective because your backup systems could be in the process of restoring your environment long before the ransom uh, process has even begun to restore via that way. Now, it's still completely possible that the ransom decryption process may outperform the backup restore, but probably not by a lot. But one is a should be a reliable process that is tested and known, working with known good data uh, and so forth with processes that your IT department should already know. The other is going through an untrusted, malicious third party and hoping that simply out of goodwill that they will do the things that they promise to do after you've given them money and not try to hold you ransom for more money or not say, oh, sorry, it doesn't work. And, and of course, if the restore doesn't work, it's not like you're going to get support. There's nothing that they can do. So it, one is a very reliable process in a good environment. The other is not so in any normal environment, any environment that can consider itself production, you're going to have not just a backup, but multiple layers of backups. It is expected. We use the, the term 321 in the industry. Your data should be in at least three places on two different media and so forth. And in order for those uh, in that 
uh, terminology, we use the term backup. And backups mean that the data is decoupled. If it's coupled, it is not a backup. So if you have backups in your environment, then ransomware is essentially unable to get to those backups. And that's in the most minuscule backup environment. The, the littlest amount of effort that someone can do would still make ransomware all but completely ineffective. Now, if you're looking at something like a state-sponsored attack, okay, that's completely different. But if you're in a business less than, say, $100 million a year, that shouldn't even be on the radar of a possibility. Why would a nation state make an attack against your company? That, those kind of resources are not going to be expended. You're looking at attacks that are mostly uh, people phoning in and trying to get them to click on a link, uh, maybe clicking on a malicious link on a website, definitely email that is just spammed out, uh, maybe a, a small targeted uh, a phishing attack, but really minor things, not uh, a team of expert hackers who are breaking into your environment against all you know conceivable odds. It's not that kind of thing. So if you're in those kinds of environments, then any real backup that is decoupled from your uh, uh, main data will be plenty of protection. And of course, we recommend, and that why we, I mean, the industry. Right? This is not a, you know, not a consulting company saying, well, we recommend. This is not one or two IT professionals going above and beyond. This is the absolute standard for the industry is that we recommend that you have local backups of some sort, which of course are decoupled. They're in no way tied to the rest of your infrastructure. But then also that you have cloud or other type of online or are off-site backups. It should definitely be at a different location. And this is generally considered a minimum because uh, in, in the case where you're protecting against such as file corruption or deletion, those local backups are generally what you want to deal with in those cases. But if you're dealing with large scale damage, which could be theft, such as someone came in and stole, like backed up a truck in the night, stole all your equipment and drove away. Well, those local backups are going to be physically coupled, even if they're not logically coupled to your data. And those backups are going to be gone. So that's something you don't want to have in that way. It won't protect against that. So that's an important bit of having an offsite backup. Also, if you had a flood a fire, something like that is very easy, again, for physical coupling to impact you. So part of the full decoupling does include being off-site. Now, off-site can be a number of things. It can be cloud backup. We mostly know, you know, Backblaze B2, Wasabi, Amazon S3, and others provide amazing cloud-based backup targets. That's one way to go. And many of those offer immutability, meaning that you put your backup up there and there's no normal means of deleting or changing that data. Once it's there, it's solid. Of course, you can have retention periods and such on that, but those kinds of things are very important for protecting against ransomware because they can't be ransom against. If they were going to uh, lose that data, you would lose the entire, you'd lose all of Amazon S3, you'd lose all of Backblaze B2, really enormous things. These are highly secure, highly monitored environments. They would be extremely difficult for that to happen to, but if they did happen to them, it would not happen in conjunction with it happening to your environment. So you have that protection that they are an entirely separate entity with entirely different technology protecting your data in entirely different ways in an entirely different location, often spread across many locations. So the data protection of something like that is extreme. More traditionally, we had tape backups. It was very common to put your data on tape and then send it to someone's home to be stored, which has its dangers, but generally it's encrypted, so you have some protection there. It's also, or it was, very common to use players like Iron Mountain, who would take your tapes on a regular basis, say once a week or once a month, put them in an you know, armored truck and drive them to an underground storage facility, often in old mines, hence the term Iron Mountain, where they had tons of security and they would protect your tapes for all eternity or something down there. You also have the option of just backing up to an extra hard drive and sending it to someone's house. Even if you're trying to go super cheap, trying to do it yourself, you have options. You can also set up your own cloud backup mechanisms that basically operate the same as an Amazon or Backblaze, just on a very small and private scale. You have many, many options that, in, that give you flexibility to send all of your data somewhere else. And if you had a full on ransomware attack, every single device, even decoupled ones inside your environment were destroyed. It, it could be that your entire building burned down. It could be that uh, someone physically came in and, and took a sledgehammer to every piece of equipment that you have. It could be that uh, someone hacked every single computer that you have. Your Offsite backups would still be there. In most cases, your hardware would still be there. If your hardware wasn't, you simply order new hardware. You're going to need that regardless of ransomware, right? It doesn't matter what is going on. If your hardware is destroyed, you still have to replace it, right? But you could have offsite backups of that as well, and that would be extreme. 
but you can have that bring that in whether it's ordering it or or replacing it from your your secondary storage location and then just restore that data and in many 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 cases you also have now this is going a little bit beyond the absolute best practices into often best practices into good practices right there's a difference best practices means we basically never excuse someone not doing it like offsite backups if you don't have offsite backups you better have a pretty good excuse you better have you know the CEO said he refuses to have these backups. Okay, the CEO took over IT duties. He's responsible, right? Oh, there's, you know, some law that says we can't do it. Okay, that's, you're legally bound. But under normal circumstances, there's no excuse for not having offsite backups, or at least having tried to have them. And then that's a best practice. A good practice is having your environment easily rebuildable based on standard rebuild routines. That is, for example, uh, if you're going to be building a web server, for example, you have a standard script that builds your web server for you. It only takes a few minutes. This can vary from fairly manual, like uh, I pop in the, the USB stick and I start the install and then I have a script that is copied from our wiki and it rebuilds that server relatively quickly. And I then just restore the small amount of data that is the 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 web hosting directory and maybe the database, right? So that would be a fast rebuild where you're not dependent on your backup for the majority of the data, only the necessary data. So this is a good practice. This allows us to rebuild an environment even at a time where our backup systems may not be available yet, maybe slow and overburdened because it's restoring many different systems, things like that. There's a lot of mechanisms that the industry has to make restoring really fast and simple. Uh, and when an environment is given the flexibility to do good engineering on the system side and even far better good engineering on the software side, such as really great environments that I've worked in would do things and they would actually show full burn down and rebuilds as part of their restore process and rebuilds where they took uh, their servers and completely destroyed them, got a brand new server, often in cloud completely bare with zero data on it, had an automated script that went out to a Git repository, completely uh, installed all the necessary applications automatically, updated them automatically, detected that it didn't have data, and automatically went out to the backup system and pulled a restore using a key that was built into the scripts to bring down the data. It would actually spin up the application from nothing in the data center in under five minutes, including a data restore. Now the data set was relatively small, but the idea that we could go from, we've lost everything to having our last backup up and running through a tested repeatable process that had no human intervention other than telling the system we needed a new server, and even that in theory could be automated, that would be really extreme, was so good, it was so fast, so simple, and gave us so much peace of mind that we knew our production workloads could be back practically instantaneously, so fast we would we would have them restored before we could get a chance to have a discussion about the outage. We would be discussing what went wrong from a position of already being back up and running. We would not have to discuss you know, what we were going to do to restore and what went wrong all at the same time. Right? Completely different world. So that's a good practice. That's something that good shops should be shooting for. People need to be aware that this is what good looks like. And there are lots of companies working that way. But that's that's only good practice. But so if we're at that point, ransomware is 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 hard to even annoy us, right? If our entire environments were ransomware, what are we out? A few hours work, it's gonna be an interesting Friday. Like that's kind of it. Like that may be pretty impactful for your business and maybe not impactful at all. Uh, but that's you know a completely different thing versus we're in a huge panic, we're taking weeks to restore because we have so many backups and we don't know where they're gonna go and nothing's tested. And we're not quite sure how everything goes back together. Well, at least we have those backups and we can do it versus, oh, we actually don't have working backups. Uh, we haven't tested them. They're not real backups. They were actually part of the system. They weren't backups at all. They were just mirrors of the system. And when they got, when the original got damaged, our, our backups got damaged too, or maybe we didn't even take backups. We never checked on it, right? And now the ransomware, what, what choice do you have? You have to pay that ransom. So with best practices that are inexcusable not to have, you're essentially totally protected against ransomware. That's why they're best practices. The idea that ransomware can happen has always been, even though the mechanism and how it happens today is kind of new, 
that it was known that these kinds of risks could be out there, that it was something we had to plan against, has always been a part of backup planning time in memoria. Going back to the 1980s, we had protections against this. So nobody is in a new technology position where something's catching them off guard. Nobody is unaware of this. Nobody has been trained. No one has used common sense. No one is following just simple best practices and not being aware that this is something you can protect against, something you are supposed to protect against. And so if you have that gap, there's a major problem. No company that's doing the slightest amount of diligence should have any real concerns about ransomware. I understand that emotionally we may always fear ransomware no matter how protected we are. That makes sense. You could be behind five layers of bulletproof glass and you're still going to feel scared when someone pulls a trigger no matter how much you know that bullet can't reach you. That's kind of where you are with ransomware. But if it's that kind of emotional response, that's okay. It's good to be nervous about bad things happening, but it's bad to be nervous because we know we haven't done our due diligence and we're just waiting for our unprotected environment to become vulnerable. So if you have not taken the time to evaluate your backup strategy, have you looked to see if your backups are coupled? Have you looked to see if you have disparate media? Have you looked to see if you have physically decoupled so that you have most likely still on-site backups for those rapid restores when it's simple technology that has failed, an off-site completely decoupled, very, very heavily protected, sometimes completely offline backups that protect you should the worst case scenarios on a logical level or even on a physical level could happen. Check those now, take that moment, but that's all it takes. It's an amazing thing that we see so many companies going public saying that they've been under a ransomware attack, that they're thinking about paying a ransom, that they're down, that they have no strategy, they're figuring it out. Every one of those to an IT professional is immediately just a big banner that says we had absolutely no IT due diligence, there was no serious government governance, and we didn't have working backups. Think about that for a second. That is a 100% we didn't have backups every single time. Every ransomware piece of news you've ever heard about, unless they said we were ransomware and it was no big deal. Back up and running, not a problem because we were. if they're bragging about how well they handled it, it's because they had backups. If they're posting, if they're having to go to the SEC and register a problem, it's because they didn't do their baseline IT. And if you're not doing backups, what are you doing? This is the most critical thing we do in IT, right? So, and it's the most critical thing for the business to oversee in IT, is it, how do you have a CEO who's checking on their CIO if their CIO isn't taking backups? What is being done? What governance is happening anywhere in the organization, even outside of IT? Right? Who's looking at these budgets even casually and, and saying, this seems reasonable, this doesn't seem reasonable. Who's watching the watchers? So anytime you see that, say to yourself, wow, here's an organization that had zero care for protecting their data. Zero. Every SEC filing, every time they have to go to the shareholders and tell them that they threw away their money, every time that they're talking about paying a ransom, every single time there was something seriously wrong that everybody involved the CEO knew how to protect against it. The investors probably knew how to protect against it. The CIO, every tech, every single person working in the department, most of the accountants, most of the lawyers, a whole bunch of the line workers, they all knew how to protect the environment. Somebody decided not to, right? Someone said, we're not gonna make backups a priority. We're not gonna take backups. We're not gonna verify that the backups work, right? Yes, sometimes backups fail and no one's checking, no one's monitoring. So that's something you need to address, right? It's not just have backups, make sure they work, right? So that's that's important, but that should be part and parcel with having a service is making sure you actually have that service, right? Don't just buy a piece of software and not install it. Don't just say there's a process and, and not do it. I also want to point out, as is always said, backups are something you do. They're not something you buy. That doesn't mean that there won't be any product that you ever want to buy in regards to backups. There are good backup product vendors out there who make nice products. Some of them may make sense for your environment. That is fine. But at the end of the day, a, re a production system never needs specialty software for backups. It may be beneficial, but it never needs it. Every business has the capability of taking backups. There's no exception to that. And every business needs to. There's no exception to that. If you're getting excuses from the business, from IT, something's wrong. Investigate what is wrong. Why would they say that? Because there is no viable reason why backups can't be taken for things that are 
needed to be backed up, things that can't be recreated. You don't need to back, there's all kinds of things you don't need to back up. You don't need to back up operating systems under normal circumstances. Good design of your environment makes it that you don't need to back those things up. You only need to back up your data. So that's okay. But your data needs to be protected and people need to be checking on it. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I do work for an IT consultancy. If you are having issues, if you're an IT department and you need some guidance, you need someone to you know, bounce ideas off of or help you with projects or uh, simply oversee something, you don't know how to tackle backups in your particular environment, you don't know how to go from best practices to good practices and also be able to do immediate restores. What does that look like? How could you move in that direction over time? We would love to be able to help with that. Those are things that we do. I also wrote a book, Linux Systems Administration Best Practices, that really covers all of these things as well. Great to have on your shelf and use as a reference uh, when you're looking at things that should be being done to protect your environment. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you all next time.